Checkout Tracking by the NPD Group brings you a receipt collecting system that gathers data anonymously through technology we created, providing your businesses with answers. Hi everyone, thanks for uh, joining late in the, uh, in the procession. Um, I actually start, so I wasn't originally planned to be here. My, uh, my CEO, Stephen, was uh, intended to speak at the event. And we were in New York two weeks ago. We've just hired a, a new team out there, so we've got five people. And we were walking through the uh, passport control at JFK. And we're just about to walk through, and he starts doing this. He's like, I've not got my passport. So he'd lost his passport somewhere in New York, never to be found again. So as a result, I found out about 10 days ago, I would be lucky enough to spend some time in San Francisco, meet you lovely people, and also get to talk about their lost TV generation. So it's a, it's a nice, nice coincidence in the unfortunate circumstances. So what do I wanna talk about today? So there's a few different elements to this. When we talk about the lost TV generation, you just think of your own home. Maybe think about when you were a kid, and used to sit down with your family, the, the living room was the centre of the house in terms of how you spent your evenings, how you spent time with your family, and it's been completely disrupted. So TV is still one of the most powerful ways that you can communicate with mass audiences very quickly, but it's completely changed in the last five to ten years. And there's an argument that maybe it's not quite as effective as it once was, just due to the pure nature of how many different contracting uh, devices that we've got now in front of us. So, the few things, the three main topics I want to discuss today is give you a little bit of a background as to who Loop Me are, because I'm not sure everyone will know us. Then I'm going to talk specifically about the impact that mobile has had on the TV living room, and also how both UA and brand can be smarter in terms of using that, and some examples of how the brand working on not only TV, but any sort of brand, gives more powerful long-term results for UA clients and for performance broadly. And finally, I'm going to finish with how some of the big conventional brands, the AT&Ts and the Coca-Colas, are starting to learn from the way that performance advertisers have been working for the last three to five years. So there's quite a few different topics to run through. And as I said, I'll start off with a little bit of background for our business. So we started three and a half years ago. We are a mobile video DSP, largest one in the world with access to over 1.25 billion people. We've got offices in San Fran, New York, London, Paris, Dubai, Ukraine, Mumbai, and Beijing. And at the moment, our next big push is to move heavily into the US market and to work much more closely with everyone over here. A lot of our biggest clients are already US-based, so that's the next growth piece for us. In terms of the business itself, we have four key areas. So as I mentioned, we have a mobile video DSP. So it's all proprietary built. We also have a DMP that takes on over 30 billion data points per month. That allows us to create 250 different audience segments and it also, also gives us the ability to ingest any first, second or third party data which can then be used to drive much better results and speak to people more specifically. We have an exchange product that allows any of our demand partners or supply partners to work together with us. And finally and most importantly, any mobile company today that really has a future in the space has to be using AI and data in a much more intelligent way. So I'll give you a few examples of that. As I mentioned, the, the home has been completely disrupted. You know, we live in a world today where we have so many distractions. You know, for me, I, I just think of myself personally and I look at when I'm in my friend's house, I went, I flew back home to my, um, my godson's birthday, he's three years old, a couple of weeks ago and uh, home is Dublin it's in, in Ireland. And what happened was we walked into the living room and everyone was watching the TV. And as soon as the ads came on, he picked up his iPad and he was playing Talking Tom. Mum and dad were on their phone too. No one was speaking to each other, but no one was looking at the TV either. Now, it's still there, so it still has an amazing impact and it's still doing great things. But what a lot of big brands have started realizing is that they need to use TV with other mediums together. So they need to start thinking in a much more unified way. And that this is not just the, the big conventional brands, but actually every brand, every brand or every performance advertiser or anybody that wants to build a big business, they need to use multiple layers of advertising. And what that means is brand and performance working together. Something that has always been brilliantly done, um, I think in the UA space, especially with the big guys, you know, we've got 
We've got mobile games advertising on the Super Bowl, in the playoffs, you know, they, they know the value of brand. But I think there's lots of different ways that you can build brand and then use it in a more intelligent way over time. So the areas that we focus in terms of video are threefold. So we offer pre-roll, we offer full screen interstitial. Um, we also have native, so be that in-app or in mobile web, and HTML5. Each one of these different types of videos offers different results. It delivers a different message, and ultimately, the end goal from each one is always going to be slightly aligned with a different goal from an advertiser. So if you're trying to build brand and awareness, you take a very different path to when you're trying to get someone to convert, to download an app, and then to drive LTV and ROI. But I look at one of our biggest partners based out of London, is King.com. And if, you, if anyone's been to London recently, you, you, know, you get in a cab, maybe you get into an Uber, you drive around London and you see big double-decker buses that have been covered in King.com wraps. You see phone boxes that have got King.com all over them. They cover the newspapers, they're on TV. They do so much in the brand space. They, they really have a presence in London. You can't go far without seeing them. And everything they do, or everything they had been doing previously on mobile, was completely working back to a CPI. So for quite a long time, they had this one team building brand with traditional broadcast media, and then another team just only doing CPI. And what they started to realize is they should be using mobile to build brand first. So especially when they're releasing new games, it's a brilliant way to get that awareness piece out. It shows that the user understands what they're going to be doing, and then when they come later to see a, a performance measure or a performance um, advertising message, they click on it, they know exactly what they should expect. So they saw much better results. And there was a piece of research uh, really focusing on the impact that having brand alongside performance, what that impact is. So there's two different campaigns here. One is very simply, the blue line is a, an advertiser that only ran performance activity, so entirely CPI. They had good results. You know, They started to see some decent volume. They started to drive new users. But ultimately, the saturation point came quite early. It was very soon that they came to the point where they just found it difficult to get more users. In contrast, if you start with a brand message, the first thing you do is you get a much broader net of people. So you've got much more people aware of your messaging. It means that not only do you have more potential to build that user base, but when you do get the user base, they're a much stronger group. They tend to have much longer relationships with you. They spend more money. They're really loyal customers. So that direction over time and that kind of constant messaging has built a much stronger relationship. So the idea of someone downloading your game and then turning it off after two days is much less likely if they've had a longer term relationship with you from a branding perspective. So you know, if you take a, a step forward in terms of the, the best process for that, so of course, you know, the, the most basic in, in terms of marketing communication, if you speak to anyone from Unilever or Coca-Cola, they'll say, the first thing I need to do is drive awareness and interest. Awareness first, then that gives me interest. When I get to interest, I then obviously I have to get to a conversion. Conversion used to be buying a bottle of Coke. Now a conversion is someone downloading. So someone actually taking on your product and bringing it into their phone, which is obviously a very personal device to everyone. Then at that point, you can start to drive LTV growth, and ultimately you can optimize to the best users. Now, you don't have to do all that. You can go straight to conversion to start off with. But as you can see, the group of people is instantly smaller. So by starting with a broader message, we deliver much stronger results. And that's where using mobile alongside various different media channels has the most impact. If we go a little bit further, you know, we know how to drive the awareness, we know how to get the install, but ultimately it's at that point of conversion that data needs to become heavily into the fold. You know, we're working uh, with a broad range of very small to very big uh, UA clients at the moment. And one of the, one of the challenges we have with some of our smaller or our newer clients is that they, they're reluctant to share data. So they know exactly what they want someone to do. They need you to get to level five, and on that basis they know that you're going to be a stronger customer for them. But what they're not doing with all of their advertising partners is actually passing that data back. And the ones that are certainly are very few are doing it on a live basis. Now, I completely appreciate that that's quite a big undertaking, but just by having that ability, if you think like that from the very outset, if you say, I want to be able to share that data with my partners from the beginning, then straight away, those partners can optimize to your actual goals. So not just to, com to conversion, 
but to LTV, to a certain point in the game, to an interaction point, to an engagement. And that's where you see much stronger use for your dollars. So every one of those dollars goes two or three steps further than they would do without the data piece involved. Of course, when you have the data, then it's key to drive further action through promotions and retargeting. You know, again, it, it seems a simple thing, but there's so many partners out there that either from a, an advertiser point of view, they're not sharing the data, they're not sharing blacklists, so they're not talking about their key customers, or from a, a I suppose, a, a partner that's sharing the ads, they're just not using that data wisely. They're not ingesting it and understanding, well, how do I find more users like your core audience? How do I find more of those people? It should be commonplace, it should be on you know, every campaign we run, but unfortunately it's not been pushed as, as strongly as it has. Stepping forward from that, you know, it really focuses on the data, and I, I, you know, I keep talking about data, and I think I've been to a lot of talks in the last few days, and everyone focuses on the same things, and there's a really good reason for that. It's because we haven't quite caught up with the capabilities that are available. So certainly, from my perspective, when you're speaking to any partner and they start talking about artificial intelligence, it's really trying to get under the hood of what that means. You know, what sort of algorithms is someone building? How much time have they spent on it? Are they using your data with other people's? Is yours housed in its own separate server? Really important questions to ask when you're working with someone on a really large basis. On some really simple levels, what we have seen, if you look at just on a format basis, so this is an example of a publisher that we've been, sorry, a developer we've been working with for some time. Uh, lots of different games, but they had a launch coming out. So we compared static native, just as a one format, to native video. So everyone knows that native video and video broadly is just by far the most powerful way to get your message across. Funnily enough, today I heard one exception. So I've spoken to a lot of, uh, of our clients, and surprisingly, Uber cannot make video work. They, they can't get anyone to use video to then download their app. It just doesn't work for them. I guess it's all about the, the moment in which you're going to uh, choose to, to download an Uber. The flip side of it is, if you're on a dating app, then it's the best time to get an Uber, I guess for good and bad reasons. But the point here is that at that product launch stage, the video is clearly much more powerful. But over the course of time, that impact will start to fade. Maybe the budgets are dropping a little bit. When you then bring strong AI into the fold, you can bring your performance, the number of installs, number of downloads you're getting, back up to that near launch stage by having the right AI involved. So it drives really, really strong results. And as I mentioned at the outset, you know, the big brands are starting to take notice of what the equally big and sometimes smaller brands have been doing in the mobile space for some time. So Smox was some research that was created with over $2 million of investment from these four brands. And what they were trying to determine was, is when they look at their entire media plan, how should money be spent and what will give them the best results? Now, part of it was working with the MMA, so they obviously wanted to see what the impact of different spends on mobile would be. And the results are really outstanding. So what every one of these brands found is that with an average in the US of 3% spend on mobile, they should be between doubling that up to five times the volume of investment just to get the optimum results. Look at someone like AT&T, who on the study were one of the lowest spenders in mobile space, which is, it, it just feels completely counterintuitive, but they realize that their spend on mobile should be absolutely phenomenal. And what they've learned, again, I feel it's things that we already knew for quite a while in the UA space, but I'll go into a little bit of detail. So format is absolutely integral. Um, banners, not surprisingly, you know, they just haven't been as effective as, as some of the other formats that are available. Video has been absolutely brilliant. They found that native video in particular was one of the most powerful in terms of the cost point and the impact it had on the brand. Also frequency was important. You know, from a creative perspective, three to four was a maximum. There's no need to hit people 15 times. It just doesn't prove effective. Location, you know, naturally from a brand perspective, location is very important. Retail in particular, looking at not only the location of where someone is, but where they have been and where they're more likely to be in the past had a really big impact on the success of the campaign. The time of day, so, you know, again, it's something that we've known for so long, but if someone downloads a game at 2 a.m., um, let's assume they've got problems sleeping, there's a good chance they're going to be playing it for quite a long time. Someone downloads a game on their way home on the bus, you're probably lucky if you get 10 to 15 minutes. So while you'll get a lot more people on the bus, you're gonna get much better users at different times. And, and it's all the type of thing that we've already known. Obviously in the brand space, it's completely different. You look at things like aligning your TV budget with your mobile spend and trying to use that sort of syncing. And finally, creative. 
So the creative itself for so long has been a desktop creative put onto a mobile or it's been a TV creative put onto a mobile. What brands are realizing now is that they need to have mobile specific creative, they need lots of different variation and it needs to be built a slightly different way. So I just thought I'd share one example of one of the more successful creatives we've had recently and a little bit on the, the kind of the line of what Facebook are talking about but having six second videos, six, five, ten, just shorter format videos but lots of different variations but they're not just ending there, actually going a step further and asking the user to engage and interact with the ad itself. So from a UA side, what we're seeing with this sort of ad is having a video and then giving the user the ability to play a small part of the game or to experience a small part of the game actually drives fantastic value from the user because they know what type of game it is, they know what to expect. Sometimes, you, you know, I, I got sent a, a creative asset a couple of weeks ago and I watched it and all that happened was it was a guy walking around the street and his phone kept buzzing and little characters kept appearing and it didn't make any sense. I couldn't tell what the game was and not surprisingly it was incredibly hard to get users and retain them. But just by having an obvious creative that explains the experience then when people do pick to download or choose to, to take that onto their phone you get them for a much longer and you get them for a much higher value. So in summary the, the, the whole process I suppose of reaching the lost TV generation is that there's been great disruption. I think that the invent of great new devices, bigger screens, you know, the, from a creative perspective, greater formats and ultimately data alongside programmatic means that there are so many more touch points with which we can communicate to our audiences. If we try to be smart and try and use what's available, then we can have much more lasting memories from them for us and we can build a much closer relationship. And that's all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. I'm sure there are some questions from the audience. Any questions on the lost TV generation? Okay, I have one question for you. Yeah. There is one? Great. Excellent. There's the microphone. Yeah, I just had a quick question. You mentioned you have, uh, that, you know, brands are switching to mobile, but you have a lot of business case that kind of prove this trend. And where is this trend? Can, is this is this the start of a trend? Uh, when does it start? And you know, just get a more yeah. understanding on this. So I've, you know, I've been working in kind of mobile network space for five years. So that started at Millennial Media five years ago, and at that point. It was very difficult to get brands to embrace mobile in a big way. They knew they had to do it. You might get a small test. It became uh, something that they were aware of. But I absolutely think that brands are massively embracing mobile. So this year in the US, by the end of the year, there will be more digital video viewed on mobile devices than on desktop. That's as important as when there was more news articles read on online versus print. That's the turning point we're just coming to now. So these big brands have absolutely realized it, and it's coming at a time where you've got so much great format, so much data that you can use. So you know, the, the Microsoft example, that was a quarter of a million dollars. The research was the four brands I showed you, they spent, as I say, $2 million. And we're starting to see now that digital has taken over TV in terms of the biggest individual spend. Half of that is search, so it's a slightly skewed uh, statistic, but it's still a very big part of it is display. And mobile now, in a lot of cases, is really taking a big chunk, chunk out of display. So it, it has been happening for quite a few years, but I would estimate that, and we've looked at this in quite a lot of detail, if you look at someone like a Unilever, so they spent $8 billion last year. As they move forward, they reckon about one in eight of the dollars they spend will move into mobile, and specifically mobile video. So that means you've got the, one of the top three biggest advertisers in the world committing to spending eight, uh, over a billion dollars potentially on mobile video in the next five years, or in a year, but in the next five years. So there's a real big shift just happening today, and I think that there's a lot of traditional um, media is quite scared of it. I saw uh, Fox Networks presenting, and they showed this huge video, and it, you know, it was on a, a screen kind of four times the size of this, and they said, this is the difference between um, TV advertising and mobile advertising, and the TV was the, the Budweiser ad with the lost puppy, and it was, you know, it was incredible. You're watching it in a cinema, so you know, it looked absolutely amazing. And they said, and here's the difference on mobile, and there's a guy who walks into a lift, and he looks at it for a couple of seconds, and he puts it back in his pocket, and they don't see it. Like, there's absolutely fear. Instead of embracing it and realize that the two need to work together, he was really afraid of the fact that you know, people are now multi-screening and watching and consuming in different ways.
Yeah, but he's working at Fox, I guess. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, why. Exactly. Now, I mean, this sounds like a fantastic opportunity to uh, for an for a game developer to um, uh, profit from that trend and uh, basically seeing much more brand videos in their own games, etc. And yeah. uh, get some some better CPMs from from that, etc. But at the same time, it's also a threat, right? Um, because as a game developer, you also want to get your game discovered, and video has been, uh, for, s for many games, a very, very good way to find users that understand what they're going to install. Um, so you were saying that as a, as a game developer, you should also look at um, kind of brand marketing if you add that to performance you basically tap into a bigger audience yeah. what ca i mean i can see that for king mm -hmm. uh, but how could um, a smaller developer start exploring that opportunity yeah so you know someone like king obviously have got tremendous budgets and they can go straight to tv or you know machine zone can go straight to the super bowl you know that's not for everyone but brand doesn't have to be tv you know having a brand ad that runs from a mobile perspective before you start looking for downloads just to get that awareness can be done in a really cost efficient way so you look at test markets and you can look at very specific audiences so if you know exactly the people you want to speak to mobile can be a really easy way to get a brand message out at a low cost and then straight away you've got that data you've collected to retarget remarket those people and hopefully not only do you get the users but you get longer value and longer lifetime users okay that's very interesting okay more questions Okay, well then, thank you very, very much, Peter, for your presentation. Thank you, thank you very much.